welcome to this week's uh, Agricultural Market Situation Outlook webinar, part of our ongoing webinar series we've been running since COVID hit in mid-March. Uh, following the usual format, uh, there will actually just be three of us speaking this week, uh, myself, Dave Ripplinger, Brian Parman, our Egg Finance spe Specialist, and Tim Petrie, our Livestock Market Specialist. Uh, following the usual format where we'll have uh, three presentations, in, in this case, uh, followed by Q&A. Uh, you're welcome to answer or excuse me to ask questions using chat or the Q&A feature at any time but we won't get to those until the end of the presentation. With that I'm going to turn it over to Brian Parma. Hey thanks Dave I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit so it doesn't cut off my my hat NDSU agriculture but uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about again our unemployment situation which continues to dominate some of the headlines and rightfully so as it's a big driver in the economy. Uh, I want to talk about national as well as North Dakota, some about our oil and tax revenue, and then I'm going to go into some of the uh, ag finance and lending conditions that we're seeing um, in the Midwest that the Kansas City Federal Reserve has put together. So my first slide just shows the, the typical graph that you guys have been seeing with the initial weekly jobless claims put together by the St. Louis Federal Reserve. And for the first time since we peaked in late March, early April, we've seen initial jobless claims increase. Now it's a, compared to the numbers being filed, 100,000 uh, uh, person increase is not overly dramatic, but it does reverse a trend um, that we've seen now for several several weeks and months in a row of this these newly filed jobless claims continuing to decrease. And right now, if you look at the tail, it's actually increased a little bit for the first time in several months. So we'll continue to monitor uh, that situation, but it is showing that some businesses and some folks are, are being laid off perhaps that went back to work. And the next slide shows the continuous jobless claims. And that has continued to trend down a little bit. New jobs are being found um, at a higher rate than jobs are being lost. So these continuous claims keep going down. So that's a good sign. That, 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 that's definitely a good sign, although not trending down as fast as we would like, uh, down approximately 1.2 million continuing, continuous jobless claims. And when you look at these graphs, by the way, that we're showing, I'm showing, on long time horizons, you see the gray section and the white section, the white being to the left and the gray to the right. Gray in indicates a recession. And so as you look at this, the reason that part is gray is we are officially in a recession right now uh, by the standards and metrics whether that are set forth, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. So that's what they're looking at. And in order for us to get out of recession, we have to have some positive growth in, in, in a quarter to call the, the recession over. Okay. So then my final slide there on, uh, on the national numbers is the U.S. unemployment rate, which sits at 11.1%. A lot of, uh, and, and it has continued downward since peaking there in April at close to 15. Now, it hasn't gone quite as high as some folks thought that it would, but the projections right now are an end of year unemployment rate around 9%, which would be around where it was during the Great Recession. So this would be, you know, three quarters uh, uh, of the year at double digit or close to double digit unemployment, which again is as, is, is as bad as it was during the Great Recession. And hence this talk on Capitol Hill, Congress, and the executive branch uh, discussing uh, a fourth round stimulus. Now, what that's going to look like, there are claims all over the place. Uh, the House passed a, uh, I think it was called the HEROES Act, which had a whole bunch of stuff in it. Uh, there's been talk that the Senate wants, and that was a $3 trillion bill. There's been talk that the Senate wants uh, to keep it below $1 trillion. There's been talk of check direct checks again or... Uh, tax holidays, basically reducing the federal income tax rate, all kinds of things are on the table right now. And so we, we won't know for probably at least a few weeks exactly what it's going to look like. And my guess is if, there, if it is passed, it'll be passed in the 11th hour uh, right before uh, uh, the House go, goes into recess. So stay tuned for that. Um, but we are still in a pretty precarious situation as far as this goes, hence the discussion of a, another stimulus. Now it's I would guess that there's going to be an ag component to it as well. Uh, there was in the last one. I, I don't think that the, those who represent heavily ag 
business states are going to let something go through without a, a component in there for our producers and farmers around the country. But again, what it's going to look like uh, remains to be seen. So my next slide looks at uh, North Dakota specifically, and it fairly well mirrors the rest of the country. Uh, so continuous claims have trended down for the most part. That's the, the bar chart on the left. You can see they peaked there in late April, early May, and so far have been trending downwards. And then initial weekly claims, just like, just like the U.S. as a whole, you see that bar on the far right is, is bigger than the last two or three, showing that initial claims this last week, uh, the ending in, on Saturday, uh, increased a little bit. And so we're kind of mirror, mirroring the country as far as that goes, though our overall unemployment rate is lower. And you can see that on the next slide. You look at June 2020, uh, 6.1% compared to May 2020, 9.1%. And with the country around 11% is total, North Dakota is about you know, a little over half that. So uh, again, we're in a better place as far as unemployment goes than the rest of the country by a pretty good margin. And I think a lot of that's because of, of our, our ag sector really hasn't seen the big layoffs and problems that you see in the services sector, such as uh, hospitality, uh, food service, those kind of things. And then where we were this time last year, about 2.4%. So yeah, we're about a little more than double where we were last year, not nearly as bad off as the rest of the country and certainly improved since last month by, by you know, reducing unemployment by 3% from 9 to 6.1%. So where are the hot spots for unemployment in, the, in our state? Uh, you look at this map here, you see a lot of it in oil country there in the west. Uh, McKenzie County, um, Stark County there at 9.5%, McKenzie at 9.4%, Williams at 12.5%, and then up near the top in Rolette County, about 15.4%, they're the, they're the high of the state. But for the most part, most most other counties in that three to six percent range, uh, sort of close to the state average that you see. So just kind of showing, and a lot of that has to do obviously with the oil and gas companies uh, there in the western part of the state, with a, a lot of layoffs and issues going on there. Speaking of oil and gas revenues, uh, here's the state uh, allocation uh, tax revenue allocations for oil and gas. And you can see April, if you look at the line graph on the bottom, you can see that April was about on projection. So that black line is actual and the dotted line was the uh, projection from the uh, legislature. And June 2020 is particularly bad, uh, way down. Uh, the, table, the table at the top shows the forecast was for 197 million in June. The actual was 38 million. So if you look in the gray there on the left at the very bottom, 38.05 million for a difference of 159, almost $160 million. So basically an 81% decline from what was projected. So for right now, the biennium uh, forecast was that we would have around uh, $2 billion or $2.2 billion in oil revenue so far. We actually have 2 billion. So we're about 9% behind uh, where the projections were for the current budget. Now, I don't have the general fund chart yet. It wasn't uh, completed by the time uh, this presentation came about. So all I have is the oil and gas. So uh, when, I, when I talk next in a, in a couple of weeks, I'll, co I'll go over the general fund. But for now, we can see the oil and gas revenues are considerably behind for the last couple of months of where the projections were, putting us about 9% below the for, uh, where we were forecast to be. Okay, so I want to shift gears now to talking about um, ag lending and credit conditions. And these charts and a lot of this information, pretty much all of it, is collected from the Kansas City Federal Reserve. They do a really good job putting together uh, credit and lending conditions and reports such as this. And what this chart shows is the change in non-real estate loans by purpose, okay, just like the title says. So if you look at the total, 2020 is this gray bar, so the total on the left, and 2020 is this gray bar. So total loans in billions of dollars in 2020 is way down from where it was in 2019. It was actually up. In 2020, it's down nearly 15%, okay? So the percent change is the, 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 the striped line there, so down almost 10% there. And then if you look at feeder livestock, okay, down, uh, their, their loans down. Um, the only one that's really staying the same is other livestock operating 2020 loans down considerably machinery and equipment and all other 
So all the gray bar is below zero. So we're seeing a lot less uh, loans being issued to our producers this year relative to the last few years. Okay. So my next slide then shows uh, credit conditions for the first quarter. And if you look now, remember the first quarter uh, COVID had not hit yet so much. I mean, it was very the tail end of the first quarter there in March where, th you know, the stuff hit the fan, so to speak. And the Minneapolis uh, uh, Federal Reserve is our district. Okay. And so if you look in 2020, uh, loan repayment rates actually had declined in, in, in our area before this even pandemic really hit uh, the most. Okay. So our area, and a lot of that's going to be dairies. Okay. Because uh, you've got Wisconsin and Minnesota who are included in, in our district, uh, North Dakota and Montana and South Dakota as well. And so a lot of that is the dairies, but still Minneapolis showing the largest decline in 2020 in farm loan repayment rates and then farm income in 2020 Minneapolis uh, Federal Reserve, so our district, again, the lowest, um, with Kansas City not very far behind, and that's primarily crop and livestock production, or farm income, I'm sorry, is on the right. So our farm income is, uh, is, is quite a bit lower uh, in the Kansas City as well as the Minneapolis uh, area. So repayment rates down considerably, uh, farm income down considerably, and actually the amount of loans requested, or the amount of loans granted down considerably. I, sh I shouldn't say the word requested because there were, a lot of this has to do with the fact that some loans are being denied or they're being reduced. And that explains a lot of the reason that the actual loan loans being issued uh, have declined. So my next slide shows delinquency rates uh, for, uh, for the area. And if you look at uh, the graph on the left, you can see delinquency rates have been rising for the last four years from 2016 in pretty much every category, both real estate and non-real estate loans. The delinquency rate's been increasing. Now, it's increasing from a really low number. Okay, 2016 was around 1%, 1 to 1.5%. But we still, you know, we've doubled uh, that delinquency rate in the last four years. So it's not high. I wouldn't call it high yet but it is concerning that it's starting to trend, uh, trend higher. And then total delinquency, delinquent balances in the first quarter. If you look 90 days past due, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 2016 was the high and 2020 though is considerably higher than uh, any of the years with the exception of 2016. The gray bar there on the right uh, uh, graph showing 90 plus days past due, that's 2016. And then the uh, brown bar to the right on the 90 days past due portion is 2020. So that's showing that, yes, there was quite a bit of stress going into this. And remember, again, this was from the first quarter, okay? This was before the pandemic hit. This was before we saw extremely low commodity prices, uh, corn prices, soybean prices, everything else, basically crater uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the, the other thing, though, to keep in mind is that the uh, with the CARES Act that was uh, passed, there is some assistance, and this is all going to go into incomes that farmers are going to use to pay any, any bills or debts or, or anything like that. So that's going to help out a lot, uh, but we'll, we'll see going forward just exactly how much. So speaking of the CARES Act uh, and the Payment Protection Program, uh, the Kansas City Fed basically looked at PPP loans reported in the first quarter for May, and the share of ag total loan volume to farmers, 22% were PPP loans. Okay, so that's a pretty big share. That's more than a fifth and less than a quarter. And the share of banks reporting these PPP loans were about 9 to 10%. Okay, so most states received uh, ag PPP loans, 39 total. And the average size was almost $100,000. Okay, and the median was 26. So there was a lot of small PPP loans, uh, but there was a lot of really big ones. When the median, when the average is that much higher than the median, that means there was some a few, but really big loans dragging that average well above the median. So most loans were actually uh, twenty six thousand dollars or or less, or, or or half the loans were twenty six thousand dollars or less, and most loans were probably not much more than that to keep the average that low. So finally, uh, when we look at the CFAP, which was that portion of the CARES Act that went to ag, uh, it was weighted quite a bit more heavily to livestock. So the percent of the dollars per head, if you look at live cattle, feeder cattle, and then especially market hogs, about 30% 
of the revenues they generated were from uh, were, would be from CFAP. If you look at crop, corn was more like 10%, soybeans down around seven, and wheat closer to five. So this initial CFAP, the CFAP program was more heavily weighted, and as Tim Petrie can attest, it had a huge impact on uh, live cattle and feeder calf prices, as well as hog prices, much more so as a percentage of their total value than they did on crops. I know a lot of crop farmers saw corn go down below at or below $3 for spot prices. Wheat went way down, soybeans went way down. But when you think about feeder cattle and live cattle, feeder calves were closer to $155, a hundredweight going down almost to a buck. I mean, that's, that's a huge decline, you know, 30% or more on, on, on our livestock and hogs had it even worse. So that, that's why it was weighted that way. That's why it turned out that way was the impacts that it had. And so this illustrates just how big of a percentage of CFAP was weighted toward livestock versus crops. Now, if there, if, and when there is another program, I have no idea what it's going to look like, but uh, we'll see. And it'll probably be something like this where we get trickle trickled in information uh, and we won't know what's in it until it's actually published and passed. And that's typically the way these things go. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Tim Petrie, our livestock economist. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm just going to follow up with some of the stuff that Brian talked about. Um, and I'm um, not going to spend a lot of, I've got a, quite a number of slides and I'm going to spend a lot of time in each one. The main thing that I want to show you is how we compare to last year at this time because, and I'm going to expand and, and talk about a number of market classes, not only cattle, but also hogs and lambs and some poultry and other things. Just to show you where we're at now, I could spend uh, 20, 30 minutes on each slide, but instead I'm just going to spend a, a couple of minutes. And again, uh, Brian gave a nice, nice introduction into this. Start with slaughter steers, five market uh, average here. And the, the red line is this year. And as he said, we did have a big impact on slaughter steer prices. Uh, due to COVID. We were expecting prices to be very similar to the last couple of years. In fact, USDA was predicting that and the futures were uh, predicting that. But instead, as you can see there, we, uh, we've we had quite a bit lower prices. In fact, on the right-hand side of the chart, on January 10th, the uh, futures market there, uh, you know, at 122 just showed that it was the futures market was saying we're going to have the same prices we had the last three years, as a matter of fact. And uh, now the the uh, DEES futures are ten dollars uh, under that. And uh, so, <clears throat> and, you know, right now, com uh, compared to last year, uh, we're down sixteen, seventeen dollars. Uh, two weeks ago in the webinar, I told you that I thought that the bottom had been reached in fed cattle, and indeed that was true. We have increased a little bit the last couple of weeks, and that is good news, but it's there's still uh, quite a ways to go to get back to last year. Uh, but, you know, the futures market, again, says we're going to have continued improvement uh, throughout the year. In fact, get to August futures uh, a little bit a uh, tiny bit above what they were last year. But again, last year we had the Tyson fire we were dealing with. And so prices were lower than they, than they might have been. So anyway, we'll see some recovery uh, going on there. But as of now, it, it looks like uh, due to the pandemic and so on, uh, we'll be below last year. So go to the next slide. Uh, what probably more people are interested in in North Dakota in our area up here is, is calf prices. And again, as Brian said, we, you know, we were doing, we were expecting a really good year for calf prices uh, at the beginning of the year. All fundamentals were really, really good. We had record beef exports and <clears throat> record domestic demand, high stock market. We had fewer calves to, uh, we're going to sell this fall and uh, just more on that kind of at the end but uh, of what the calf crop might look like and uh, but anyway the pandemic hit and as he said as Brian said prices crashed but you know they've leveled out and uh, and, and uh, 
seasonally, you see uh, the last three years we were at 180 and we would have certainly been at 180 uh, this year. We're already at 176 back there uh, at the end of February, 1st of March. And so we would have certainly been right up there at 180. And then in the fall, we would have been probably closer to that blue line, which is 2018. But, you know, just looking at where we are now compared to last year, we're not that far, just a couple dollars off from last year, which is, uh, you know, a, a feat given fed cattle prices are 16 to 17 below, but of course it's, it's all due to corn. So, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a while here, but anyway, the big question is for this fall, what will they be? And again, that's uh, kind of a loaded question. Uh, earlier on, I was saying we can probably expect lower prices, but right now <clears throat> several things indicate that we, <clears throat> you know, maybe have similar prices to last year, which weren't that good. I, I'll grant you that, but still better than they might have been given the pandemic. So go to the next slide. Uh, the reason why we have uh, feeder calf prices similar to last year right now and why our expectation for this fall may be even given lower fed cattle prices is uh, uh, on this chart here with corn. You'll call last year corn prices really, really spiked in the last month or so because of uh, the, the thought that there would be a lot of less corn planted and so on. And then when the corn uh, did get planted, they came back down. But, you know, last year at this time in Omaha, I like to use Omaha corn price because that's where the major feeding is and where our feeder cattle might go to be fed. We had 450 corn last year, 312 now. So we're almost a dollar 40 lower than we were last year. And again, uh, USDA backed off their uh, a big almost 16 billion bushel but there's still over 15 bush billion bushel corn crop for this fall so that's put definitely putting a, a lid on corn prices and you know december futures there are you know uh uh, at relatively low levels. So that's helping the calf market and we'll go to the next slide also is a big player in the, in the heavier weight uh, feeder cattle side. Here's the 750 to 800 pounders. And again, took a big hit, big hit right there early with the pandemic. And uh, again, some payments for those that, that sold uh, there earlier in the, in the year, in the March time period. But we've, you know, since April, we've seen a gradual uptick and that's due to corn going down and, you know, corn was affected negatively by COVID as well. And so we are still, uh, a, you know, five to seven, eight dollars lower than we were last year at this time, but they were spiking last year at this time because corn all of a sudden was going down. Kind of interesting if we look at fall, the fall futures are right up where they were last year. And in fact, we get to the November futures up there, 143, they're just slightly above last year. So the futures market now is staying on these heavier weight uh, yearling cattle will have basically the same prices that we had last year. And indeed, if fed cattle, if demand picks up and the pandemic doesn't get worse and exports uh, continue, we could even do better on fed cattle than we first looked at in this chart. And that would even help us there. But it's, this is all due to corn being low compared to uh, last year that, that's putting us here. And so, uh, again, the corn crop isn't in the bin. A lot of things can happen, as we know, last year. But so far, the, the weather has been conducive. But again, uh, with the pandemic, having prices similar to where they were last year in the fall, I think it is a feat. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, just finish up. I've showed you this slide a couple times. I think I showed it to you last time, so we won't dwell on it. But anyway, here's uh, call call prices that are actually right now above the last couple of years. Again, uh, they took a big hit there into April, but uh, you know it came back and always look to fall. They always decline there in October, so just kind of a signal for you. No reason to think that they wouldn't do that. Um, you know, maybe be. It all depends on weather and drought and so on, and and but we have do have a smaller cow herd, so maybe not as big a culling 
this fall, and so that would help on price a little bit, but they always go down in the fall anyway. But as of now, here's one market class that's above last year. And for those of you in drought country that have had to move some cows a little bit earlier, at, at least the one little saving grace there is that they've been at better prices than the last couple of years. So go to the next slide. Just gonna hit some of the other uh, market classes here that I really haven't covered in the webinar very much. Here's uh, base slaughter hog prices and hog prices have taken the biggest hit of any of the livestock. And uh, you know, at one time earlier in the year, but by the end of last year, we were thinking that hog prices would be good uh, up there and uh, by that red average line, 14 to 18, because of African swine fever and the reduction in pork production in Southeast Asia. But of course that did not come to uh, fruition, although we are exporting quite a bit there, but we've got record pork exports. And of course, uh, the big backlog of hogs that we have, we're still trying to work through. Slaughter is getting up there 90 to 100%, but we've got a lot of hogs to work through. And so that's really affected that blue line uh, cash market there. And futures aren't that optimistic. Those blue squares are the the um, August, October, and these futures just remaining about uh, uh, where they are now. So not a lot of optimism there, but by next year, those uh, green uh, squares up there show the futures market for next year getting back up to more average prices, what they've been. And, you know, that's with the idea that we will get the backlog out of the way. And uh, the recent uh, hogs and pigs report showed indication that, you know, we're are slaughtering quite a few sows and that pork production by next year could fall off a little bit. And then again, expectation of record exports. So go to the next slide. <clears throat> Obviously, it's really affected the feeder cattle market. Normally, uh, feeder pigs are seasonally highest there in April, simply looking ahead because uh, butcher hog prices are usually high in July, and so feeder pigs are high. But this year, of course, the pandemic completely set that upside down with butcher hog prices falling and feeder pig prices following along and still are at low levels because you saw those futures there at 50 bucks for for uh, the carcass weight for, for hogs for the rest of the year. And so uh, feeder pig prices, unlike feeder, even though with low corn, like, uh, you know, feed feeder cattle up near last year's prices, feeder pig prices are struggling. Go to the next slide then, uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, of the uh, lamb side. Next slide, are we hung up there? Dave, there we go, whoops, yeah, there we go, market, no, back there, there we go. Uh, you know, mar market lamb prices stayed high in March, maybe a little bit longer than some of the others because of the the uh, spring holidays that we have three three important spring holidays for uh, religious holidays. But after they were over, man, the market absolutely just crashed, and uh, but it's picked up some now, and you know. Uh, uh, these are Northern Plains prices are averaging, you know, uh, right at 140, still below last year in the average, but, you know, we've seen improvement there and actually uh, lamb has been moving uh, pretty well in spite of being a relatively, uh, you know, high priced meat. And so, uh, you know, moving in the right direction there. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, talk about feeder lambs, and this is more. This is a Colorado, Texas, and South Dakota average, and uh, but again, uh, there we saw uh, you know a big decline after the religious, some of the holidays and, and the, the COVID effect and so on. But seen an improvement here. Uh, a couple things on this recent improvement in feeder lamb prices are there a lot of what's called feeder lamb prices now that go into the ethnic market you know as 60 to 80 pound lambs that are that uh, are although there we would call them feeder lambs really go into uh, an ethnic demand there and have another uh, religious holiday coming up here towards the end of july and we don't have a lot of feeder lambs right now to sell 
particular up here in the northern plains or in the inner mountain state, there'll be more available and you see that normal seasonal low uh, occurring there in the September, October, November when a lot of them hit. And so this little spike here is probably due more to the kind of short supplies and, and, and a, an ethnic demand here at the end of the month. But still, feeder lamb prices are above where they were last year. Go to the next slide then. Uh, well, you know, we don't have a lot of broilers up here, but a competing meat to, uh, to beef and the other commodities we have. Broiler prices, again, took a big hit. Did come back, but it just been kind of evened out there. I think they're, you know, broiler prices uh, seasonally in the fall are usually come down from summer highs that we didn't hit this year. But, you know, the expectation are that we'll slow up uh, broiler production by the end of the year. So, you know, prices could uh, come back up a little bit, but as of now, you know, they're relatively low. So go to the next slide. Uh, milk prices, of course, really, really were hit extremely hard. We were expecting milk prices to be better this year in that green line. This is class one milk prices. And I, I do want to make a disclaimer. This isn't necessarily what's going to end up in the mailbox price for farmers because it's a complicated issue and we have uh, milk marketing orders and so on and transportation and so on. But we've seen a big advance in milk prices. This is class one, but also in the class three that they make cheese out of and so on. A big spike up here from June into July. And so farmers are going to see better uh, milk prices um, in, in, in July, even though this might over uh, accentuate that a little bit. A couple, quite a few things going on with milk prices. One, milk production is usually historically high in May and it fell off, uh, you know, because we had a surplus of milk there when all the schools and restaurants and everything closed down. So the co-ops were, were uh, wanting producers to cut back and, and which happened and so milk production actually went down in May instead of being historically high. And what's really helped out here in the last month or so is a number of things. Government purchases is one of them. We have this farmers uh, to uh, families food box distribution systems going on. In fact, we have one in Fargo going on uh, this afternoon. And, you know, I haven't been going to any of them, but I have a neighbor that went and the last time he was there, he got two gallons of milk just, you know, in a, in a free food box, no income or anything requirements just show up. And so uh, the, the uh, government and several other government programs did buy a lot of a lot of dairy products and and so that's helped uh, things uh, and, and actually uh, cheese prices have moved up to uh, record levels and also the cure for low prices is low prices so when we had those low prices there after the COVID hit into May and so on uh, our exports uh, went up quite a bit because uh, you know we, we do export to our closest neighbors of Canada and Mexico and extremely low prices kind of spurred those. In fact, we had a record dry skim milk uh, exports back then too. So all those factors kind of together with the lower production and all those things kind of help milk price out. So farmers are gonna see better milk prices in July about where we expected them originally to be as a matter of fact. So go to the next slide. Uh, finish up here, two real important, one really, really important uh, reports out due tomorrow. The USDA semi-annual cattle inventory report uh, out tomorrow at two o'clock our time. You know, the, uh, the website is shown there also a cattle and feed report. Very important these reports are because it'll help us find out what our backlog was as of July 1st at least. And then on the cattle inventory side, you know, have we continued to decrease the beef cow herd and has the drought had any impact there? The, this semi-annual cattle inventory report is not as detailed as the January 1st report that we usually use as a guideline because we don't have state level data. This is just uh, a U.S. data, but it's still important to show us, uh, you know, how many beef cows we do have. The expectations are we'll probably have about a a percent less than we had last year. And then the big thing, of course, is uh, the, the backlog expecting, you know, the steers and heifers uh, 
over 500 pound category probably to be up possibly two to three percent or we'll have to see so again let's I, in two weeks at our next webinar, I'll uh, summarize particularly what the cattle inventory report showed and if anything, uh, you know, highlights the cattle on feed. So with that, we'll turn it over to Dave. And thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy Economics Specialist. Uh, walking through some pretty straightforward stuff in terms of what's going on in, in the market. Uh, Looking first at ethanol production, uh, continuing to recover uh, off of our lows in, in early April. You know, we are in the midst of the summer driving season and demand remains strong, uh, not what it typically is domestically, but, but strong and growing. Uh, looking forward to that to continue. Probably the, the biggest news in the last two weeks has been the, the increase uh, in spot ethanol prices, which have finally made their way into the Dakotas, which are great. Uh, following futures prices, which were here a little bit a few weeks ago and have, finally have pulled back a little bit. But if we look across, uh, you know, corn, ethanol, distillers, grains, everything is really working in the refiners' uh, favor, uh, especially that increase in ethanol prices of, you know, being, you know, 17% higher than they were about a month ago. Uh, looking at that that simple crush, again, my rule of thumb typically is, you know, $1.50 is you're a pretty happy camper and we're at $2. I'd, I'd have to go back and look and see the last time, uh, you know, that measure has been this high. Of course, it's a, a short run phenomenon, but if, if this was something that we'd expect to and uh, continue for some time, we definitely uh, expect more capacity to come online. And if it lasted or was expected to last a long period of time, we'd actually see new plants uh, being built. You know, this is most likely just kind of a temporary phenomenon with folks still uh, getting back in line uh, with with where uh, demand has has returned to be, but again, good signs for the industry, uh, and, and good signs uh, and, and kind of that support of production as we go forward. Uh, related to that, just looking at days in storage, you know, we're really back in that that uh, traditional range of between twenty and thirty days of, of ethanol and storage, far below the the fifty five fifty six it was uh, in April. Uh, had a bit of a uptick a week ago and then back down this week. Uh, really good signs for uh, the industry kind of being in balance of where where folks would like it to be. And again, that that downward tick in, in, in relative storage, you know, is, is definitely supportive of prices. Again, just looking at that blend rate year over year, not pulling uh, the gasoline number specifically, but again, Use is, is, a, is a bit high, which I, I guess is good. You know, it's still, we'd expect that almost, most, almost all of the ethanol being sold is still E10, uh, but, it, but it's still there in the blend, you know, and, and got back off of those lows from before where we were really, uh, you know, kind of actually just trying to work through the excess stocks. But this, again, is kind of a sign that, you know, the, the market is back to uh, a, a, a new normal if it is, but, but some, sort of, some sort of balance or equilibrium uh, in, in the ethanol market. Uh, one thing to just look at relatively briefly, so this is biodiesel numbers. Biodiesel is really kind of a tough thing to report on because they have much more of a lag than, than ethanol does. Uh, the most recent numbers, which just came out earlier this month, they're actually only through the end of April. And if you remember, April was kind of the, the, the worst month in terms of gasoline, diesel, and uh, ethanol use. And then obviously also here biodiesel use. So we did see that downtick uh, with that red line, that 2020 line, uh, that tells us a little bit about what's going on, but biodiesel is a really interesting animal uh, driven. Uh, the, the dynamics are quite different than they are for ethanol. Again, there's no blend wall in biodiesel. And so it oftentimes becomes that, that idea of how inexpensive can biodiesel be because it can work itself into that blend at, you know, quite variable levels. Um, and, and typically we see, you, you know, the blend rate at about 2% nationally, but it varies all over the place regionally. Again, just looking at the relative price of diesel and biodiesel uh, in any particular market. Uh, so we saw that dip and then what's happened more recently uh, is a little bit unknown. What we do know from the national oil, uh, the, the crushers, NOPA, is that the actual oil seed crush has declined, you know, month over month into June, but it's still a bit higher than it was a year ago. And again, there's a lot of things that go on, especially if you look back at 2018 and 2019, where if soybean crush is really dictating what's going on in the biodiesel market, we know that with the relationship or the activities with China and Chinese trade, 
that things are kind of all over the place that have really little to do with what's going on in the transportation fuel market or, you know, but although it does impact the biodiesel market to some extent. I'm just looking kind of at, at where, you know, use has been the 2019 line uh, there, you know, kind of sporadic, but relatively constant. Again, it's important. I think we know this pretty well in agriculture. Diesel is, is what fuels industry, which fuels freight movement. Gasoline is primarily a consumer fuel, you know, for passenger travel. Uh, diesel use is relatively constant, while gasoline use is somewhat periodic with a lot more use in, in the summertime. Uh, we saw that really precipitous drop in, uh, in, in March and April, nowhere near as severe as gasoline. So if you saw it was about a, you know, a, a, maybe a 20, 25% drop while gasoline fell by half. Again, that was this expectation that, you know, things were still going to have to move. You know, folks might not be going to work, but we we're still going to put uh, groceries in the store. And, you know, a bit of a recovery and things are, are relatively close to, to, to what we'd expect um, or, you know, to what we'd expect this time of year with a little bit of fluctuation and, and a little bit off, you know, last year's numbers. Uh, some last uh, notes that have been really big news, especially nationally uh, in the energy space. And that was a decision by uh, U.S. District Court, um, which ordered DAPL or, or uh, Energy Transfer Partners, the folks who, who built and operate DAPL, uh, to drain the pipe uh, because the environmental impact assessment that was expected to be done by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had not been completed in a manner that was satisfactory to the court. Um, so that was issued about two weeks ago. Uh, definitely bad news. Uh, a few days later, the Court of Appeals, so the next rung up in the court hierarchy, basically issued a stay saying, no, we're going to allow DAPL to continue to operate uh, at least for a couple more weeks as we allow uh, folks to respond with some additional information. Uh, I think all of us are really familiar with DAPL, having li lived through the protests and whatnot, uh, you know, about four years ago. Um, you know, looking at what, what's going on, you know, right now it moves about a third of North Dakota's oil production, or at least what it was before COVID, you know, half a million barrels per day. It was actually undergoing the, the permitting and planning process and the subscription process of doubling that. Um, one of the, the, secret blessings with, with this decision or with COVID is that since production has declined, there's not going to be a huge uh, squeeze or a lot of pressure put on barrels that are trying to get out of the state. Um, if we were at full production, we would have a, a heck of a conundrum going on. And even though you know, we do have rail capacity, we do move some oil by rail, a lot of that infrastructure simply isn't where it needs to be to move the amount of oil that we would have at, at full levels of production. Uh, just a little bit of hip pocket information so folks can understand the context of what's going on with DAPL. Uh, in many respects, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers never did their full homework on DAPL. Uh, you know, the, in, in some ways justified if you're familiar with the actual pass. So it's, a, it's the DAPL, which is a petroleum, a crude oil pipeline, is, you know, in the immediate vicinity within a few meters of an existing very large natural gas pipeline. Uh, Corps of Engineers, to, to, do it, to do a full environmental impact assessment takes years. Uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers said, hey, you know, we'll, we'll gladly do it. It'll take years, but it would slow things down. Uh, and Energy Transfer Partners wasn't really uh, happy to hear that because there was oil that needed to be moved. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the ETP folks went ahead and built it while there were still some of these legal questions open. Now we've come to the point where it's like it, where the court – has basically said, you know what, we need to know full and well what this means to the environment, you know, as, as, as stressed, especially by Standing Rock tribe. Um, and that's kind of where we sit. Uh, NEPA in and of itself, if you didn't take a course in environmental policy, so NEPA is kind of the big rule that says, hey, if you're, if you're going to do a, a big project that affects federal lands or federal property, you have to do a really big environmental uh, impact assessment. Since the core controls the Missouri River, uh, NEPA applies, and there are certain things that have to be done. And, you know, according to the courts that, you know, what was done, it just isn't sufficient. And that we're now in this, in this situation where, depending on what the court decides, if they're going to be somewhat satisfied, will they allow DAPL to continue to operate uh, before they make a final decision? And that would be before the court might submit a full study, which would be supportive of the project. 
And again, a, a really troubling uh, piece of news, again, especially long-term, you know, looking at what DAPL meant to uh, the North Dakota's oil industry in terms of reducing transportation costs uh, to the, the refining infrastructure, you know, it was, it was tremendous. You know, we saw basis change by, you know, five to $10 um, as soon as DAPL came on board. Uh, and also too, just in terms of safety, we, you know, we've avoided some of the, the rail safety issues, which has been helpful as well. But again, now it's, it's, it's essentially in the, in the hands of the courts and we'll know a little bit in, in the upcoming weeks of what's going to happen, but this is, uh, leads to a lot of questions and also it kind of returns to a, a bigger issue wrestling with for a long time is how much, uh, how, how, how much are folks interested in investing in energy projects going to deal with uh, before they say it's just not worth it? And, you know, clearly there's process and, and that process was known beforehand, but the onus of dealing with the courts, because uh, many of these projects are challenged in the courts, you know, is that really worth uh, pursuing depending on whatever the relative uh, returns might be to the project outside of, outside of those court fees? So that's what I had, and uh, th that concludes our part of the our presentation, part of the the webinar. Uh, open it up for questions in just a second. Uh, just to let you know, we do have three scheduled webinars left this summer, uh, every other week uh, until Labor Day. So on August sixth, August twentieth, and, and September third, uh, at the same time and at the same URL that you visited today. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Again, you can use the the chat feature. Uh, and Brian just, you know, sent a similar invite. Uh, also, uh, that Q&A uh, feature, we can use that as well to field questions. If you have <clears throat> any questions otherwise, you can invite us out, uh, nudge us outside of this. Uh, also know that a copy of, of the, the PowerPoint as well as a recording of this webinar will be available at these two websites, uh, hopefully within a few hours and for sure within a day or two. Uh, if you want to see what, we, see again what we talked about today or anything we might have talked about in, in previous editions. Um, as questions are not coming up, I was wondering if the panelists had any comments or thoughts that kind of came to mind uh, after they spoke. Yeah, this is Tim. I think I forgot to say when I was talking about the upcoming cattle inventory report, but another real important thing we want to find out is this is USD's first estimate of our calf crop for this year. And so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we were expecting uh, lower calves this fall because we had fewer on January 1st, fewer uh, beef cows. And But uh, this will be a, a first good indication of how many calves and, and likely how many fewer calves we'll have to sell uh, this fall, which, you know, is, is going to be important for prices as well. So that's my comment there. Yeah, I've got a question for Brian because I know you, you follow politics a bit. Uh, the, the unemployment kicker ends this week. Yep. Uh, and obviously folks are in Washington now trying to decide what they want to do. Um, what are your expectations in terms of them passing a bill in the next 48 hours um, to, to, to do something? Zero? Um, and zero, what, zero in the next 48 hours. Um, hmm. I, I, like I said at the beginning, I really think that this will be something that's pushed till right before recess, um, which is next month. Um, there's been talk of basically uh, keeping that unemployment kicker on there. Uh, some of it, uh, you know, there's some wild uh, claims of not only in keeping it, but increasing it. But then there's other claims of, uh, you know, going from $600 down to 450 and I've heard $300 because there's people who make the case that, and it's true, that in some cases that $600 actually makes staying unemployed more profitable than the job they had in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think I did the math on that in North Dakota and it was something like if you make less than 20 bucks an hour, uh, you were better off on un unemployment than you were actually working. So now there's a discussion of an additional bonus, weekly bonus for a while if you go back to work. So you go back to work and you collect the this, this government bonus for actually going back to work. So there's talk of that. Uh, what exactly they're going to agree to Boy, if, if, if I knew that, I would, I would be a genius because uh, I, don't, I don't think even the people voting on it know what's eventually going to be negotiated down. You know, one side who uh, has pet projects and, and concerns in one area is going to make grandiose claims for that. The other side is going to make big, 
big claims that they want this and likely it's going to be some combination of both uh, down the road. So it is a big deal though. I mean, that was a lot of money that people were, you know, I, I've been showing the tens of millions of people unemployed and that $600 a week goes a long ways. You take away 600 bucks a week. That's a lot of spending that isn't going to happen. Um, you know, folks are going to shell up if they don't have it. So, you know, we've, we've basically put a bandaid on it with some of these programs. And like you said, Dave, they're set to run out uh, here, here very soon. And when they do, uh, that's going to have a massive impact on, on the economy in general. So I, I think there's an appetite. I would say this, every, every side, whether it's the executive, the Senate, the, the House, have all said we need to pass another stimulus. So the odds of us getting one are pretty good. However, what it's going to look like at the end of the day, that, that is what remains to be seen and what the price tag is going to be. The president said $2 trillion, the House has said $3 trillion, the Senate said $1 trillion. And that's, that's, you know, that's a pretty wide range. The, la the last one was, you know, I think around two, not <laughs> counting the one before that. So, you know, what, what a $1 trillion one looks like versus a two is, is, is pretty big, especially when it comes to ag. I mean, if you got a $2 trillion bill, it's not so hard to th sneak $30 billion of, of ag aid into it. If you got a $1 trillion bill, people get a lot less, I don't know, uh, willing to let, let something like that slide because they, they start looking at these line items a lot more closely. So that's going to, that's going to be a big factor in it. And the one last thing I wanted to talk about, like it was the same thing that Tim and uh, Dave and I were talking about before this is what's going to happen with the college football season and meat demand. I mean, I know a lot of people on here are fans. A lot of folks on here have been to tailgating parties. I've been to tailgating parties at the University of Nebraska, at Kansas State, at Mississippi State, at North Dakota State. They're all the same, hundreds of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people grilling a lot of meat. And if there's, and if, if they ban tailgating, well, then people might do it at home. But if they just get rid of the games altogether, there's really no reason to actually do it anymore. And then you think about so, and then we, the amount of ribs and wings and briskets and those kind of things that, that are all uh, consumed during that period. Uh, you know, I've been thinking that, you know, we may try to come out with something to try to project what that impact might actually be on the, on the livestock and then the follow through crops market uh, that, that, that would go along with it. So, you know, the, the, we, we saw this huge impact in the spring when the restaurants basically shut down and, then we had stalls at the, at the packing plants. Well, what happens if we, that was a, a lot of that was supply side problems. And what happens if we have a big demand side problem? And that would be, because when you look at the data, July, August meat consumption per capita stays pretty consistent all the way into late fall. And then in the dead of winter, it goes down pretty, pretty remarkably. Is college football, is sports propping that up? and making it seem more like July than it would be. I mean, who wants to go grill in November if you're not grilling for a football game with your friends? That's anyway, it's just something to think about going forward that some of these discussions, canceling football and those kind of things might have real consequences for us in the ag community going forward. And uh, we might have to come up with some ideas on how we're going to work around that. I know that was long winded comment, but it's uh, been on my mind now for the last week. As well, a big the only thing I'd say about the, the next uh, stimulus bill is I remember when a billion dollars was a lot of money. <laughs> you remember the, the, the last farm bill in 2014? It was like six billion or something. That was like the, the biggest farm bill of all time. Then MFP just blew them out of the water. And then the CARES Act uh, CFAP blew that out of the water. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's 50 billion this time. I mean, I, I don't know. We, we throw around billions and trillions now like, like it's no big deal. So. I anticipate that there will be some representatives in Congress and in the Senate who are looking for uh, assistance to farmers in any bill that comes up in the future. I'm, I, I would bet a lot of money that that's the case. What it looks like, who knows, but it'll probably be there. Sounds good. No, there's no more comments. It looks like there was no questions today. We were that thorough. I want to wish everybody a, a great week, and we'll see you that, that first part of August on the 6th. Thanks.